On BBC Two now, a celebrity concert and a gala lunch provide a busy time for those dear ladies of Stacton Trestle, Dr Evadne Hinge and Dame Hilda Brackett. Diana, the serial from the novel by R.F. Delderfield, continues in 25 minutes here on BBC One. And that's after the nine o'clock news with John Humphreys. <laughs> Union tells the miners, we'll support you if you strike, but there'll be no national ballot. 20 pence on prescriptions, and it'll cost more to go to the dentists or opticians. Ulster's murdered prison official, his letter said, I'm in danger. Under arrest, the Turkish father who wants to stay in Britain. And Snowdrift, the sheep who came in from the cold, eventually. Good evening. The miners will not be holding a national ballot on whether to strike over pit closures. Union leaders have given official backing to the strikes already called in Yorkshire and Scotland, but they're leaving it to other coalfields to decide locally whether they'll join in. The NUM executive said they didn't vote on the question of calling a national strike as the more militant areas have demanded, but they would give official backing to any other area which takes similar action to the Scottish and Yorkshire men. Our industrial editor, Martin Aidney, says that could mean confusion among Britain's miners. With 17,000 men on strike or unable to work in the Yorkshire coalfield this morning, there was no shortage of pickets as the executive spent three hours discussing what to do. In the event, they've backed the local strikes called in Yorkshire and Scotland from Monday and given an effective blank check to any other area to join in but they've backed away from a ballot on national strike action. That got just three votes out of an executive of 25. In accordance with Rule 41, the National Executive Committee declare the proposed strike action in Yorkshire and Scotland and in any other area which takes similar action as official. The union will carefully monitor the situation and take any action it feels appropriate or necessary in the light of changing circumstances. What are you Mr. suggesting Scott, that areas outside Yorkshire and Scotland should now do? I think that areas outside uh, Yorkshire and Scotland uh, should take notice of the decision of the National Executive Committee and no doubt they will take all factors into consideration. We shall continue to argue with the board to stop its pit closure program and to stop its butchery of our jobs. The decision of the executive was greeted with cheers by miners assembled outside but there were some angry scenes later when the Nottinghamshire president, Ray Chadburn, was jostled. He's made clear he thinks there should be a local ballot, and as president of a big moderate area that adjoins South Yorkshire, he's not always the most popular man here. Today's decision appears to be a recipe for maximum confusion in the industry. Over the next few days, most areas will be holding meetings, and it's not at all clear what they'll decide. One important question is picketing. Will pickets from areas which have decided to strike go into other areas if they decide not to strike? In the past, when this sort of confused situation has arisen, the national executive has decided to test the mood by having a national ballot. Now it has decided not to do that. While union leaders met to discuss the NCB's closure programme, the coal board chairman was addressing himself to beginning production at a new pit. Ian McGregor visited the site of the Asfordby mine in Leicestershire, which will be open towards the end of the decade. But opening pits can be as controversial as closing them. This one will be situated on the edge of the Vale of Beaver, and conservationists and farmers are furious. As he toured the site, though, Mr McGregor's thoughts were never far from the more immediate problem of the current industrial unrest in the coal industry. Uh, today we are looking at the future. The people in Sheffield are thinking about the past. Would the prospect of a strike make you think again about your plans to close these pits? No, no, no. This is going to happen whether we have a strike or not. Are there any circumstances whatsoever in which you'd be prepared to think again about closing those pits or at least modify those plans? Sir, I act on behalf of uh, you, the taxpayers, who I think are getting a little tired of putting out so much money just to keep uh, these uh, mines going when you don't need them. Does it worry you? Unless you want to buy the coal from me, I'd be happy to sell you all the extra tons. Before leaving Leicestershire, Mr. McGregor had another warning for miners. He said that far from changing his mind about closures, a prolonged strike might force him to accelerate or even extend them. 
Prescriptions, dental charges and optical treatment are to cost more, and the government's announcement has provoked an angry reaction from opposition MPs and health unions. From April, the first prescription charges will go up 20 pence to £1.60 per item. The maximum charge for routine dental treatment will rise by a pound, and NHS lenses will cost between 20 pence and a pound more. Two in three people who obtain prescriptions get them free. They include children, pensioners and the low paid, and say the government they'll continue to be exempt. But opponents say that doesn't lessen the blow for the 30% who do have to pay. It's the fifth increase in prescriptions in four years, and according to Labour's health spokesman, more and more people are being forced to forgo the drugs they need because they can't afford them. It, it is a yet another very hard knock uh, for the sick. Uh, an increase which is treble the rate of inflation, pushes the price up to £1.60 per item. That is an eight-fold increase since 1979, when the price of a prescription charge was only 20p. And it is, in fact, a penalty on the sick. And I think that that's quite wrong. What they should have done was to hold the price of prescriptions level, or as I would prefer, reduced it, but cut back on the excessive profits being made by the drug companies and the National Health Service. The Royal College of Nursing says it plans to challenge the increases. And a spokesman for the Royal Pharmaceutical Society, which represents Britain's 34,000 chemists, said they deplored the rises. They were, he said, an attack on the sick. The last message of a murdered man was read to mourners at his funeral today. Bill McConnell, an assistant governor at the Mays Prison in Belfast, had feared that he might be killed by terrorists, and he was. There were things he'd wanted said about the Mays Prison, but not until after his death. He hinted in the letter that favours had been shown to senior IRA prisoners. Tonight, the Northern Ireland Secretary, Mr Jim Pryor, said he'd be making inquiries. From Belfast, our correspondent, Nicholas Witchell, reports. Scores of William McConnell's prison service colleagues attended his funeral. They heard the last wish of the assistant prison governor made public as Mr McConnell's cousin introduced the letter he'd left to be read in the event of his death. It will be difficult for me to read this letter and it will be difficult for you to hear it. It is addressed to all in attendance. And the subject is my demise. I have decided to write this statement since I have come to the conclusion that the public interest is best served by knowing that whatever happens to me, I spoke the truth. I did not take the decision to go public on the matter of the Hennessy report lightly. You will be gathered today asking questions which only a full investigation of the facts will reveal. Clearly, in attempting that process to continue, someone has decided that I should play no further part in the proceedings. I feel sorry for them and can only pray that their part in the story will one day be revealed. Later, members of Mr. McConnell's family spoke about his conviction that political interference had helped to make last year's mass IRA jailbreak possible. He felt there were things covered up, and uh, he wanted these things to come right out into the open. And he most certainly, uh, from conversations I've had with him, would have been under the impression that there were political constraints on the prison service. What's really at issue in Mr. McConnell's letter is this. The senior management of the Mays prison bitterly resented what they felt was political pressure to give senior IRA prisoners positions of some privilege within the prison. The most striking example of this, and the one with the most serious consequences, involved Brendan McFarlane, the self-styled commanding officer of the IRA in the Mays. He was made a prison orderly. In that position, the governors argue, he was able to organise last September's jailbreak. William McConnell, as the prison executive responsible for organising prisoners' work, was the man most centrally opposed to granting certain prisoners a privileged status. The Hennessy report on the breakout has been debated, but in the opinion of prison governors here, highlighted today in the letter of a murdered prison governor, many questions have still to be answered.
And at Moira, just outside Belfast, another part-time UDR soldier has been shot dead. He was David Montgomery, age 23, who told a priest just before his death that if an IRA death squad did confront him, he would not draw his revolver. Lance Price reports. David Montgomery was shot dead only hours after taking part in a late-night UDR patrol. Two IRA men in balaclava helmets went behind the petrol station counter and opened fire at close range. His workmates and three customers were forced onto the floor as he was killed. He'd been in the UDR for four years, and his local rector said he knew he might be a terrorist target. Yes, I think he had a suspicion that this could happen, but he had said to me if ever it did, he wouldn't really try to protect himself because he felt that he was under so many restrictions and that he'd have to give an account if he used his revolver that it really wouldn't be worth it. And an IRA rocket fired at two Army Saracen personnel carriers in West Belfast missed and hit a coal lorry. The driver was treated in hospital for shock but was uninjured. Last month, after a similar attack nearby also went wrong, a rocket hit a primary school classroom. The Belfast shipbuilders Harlan and Wolfe have won another big order. It's for six barges for the company running the Falklands Harbour project and it's worth nine million pounds. The row over the Sunday Times article saying Dennis Thatcher had access to his son Mark's business account continues to grow. Tonight, Barclays Bank lodged a complaint with the press council. They say the paper used methods that were not reputable to investigate the account. But the Sunday Times replied that Barclays' version was a tissue of invention. Philip Hayton reporting. The disclosure has provoked much controversy. The accuracy of the report has not been questioned. But Barclays Bank and the Prime Minister have complained that impersonation and deception were involved to get details of the account used by Mrs. Thatcher's son and husband. In a statement, Barclays says they were not reputable legal journalistic methods. Well, our branches have been subjected to telephone calls by people claiming uh, to be persons, in fact, who they were not, and they were in possession of information which enabled them to identify themselves or attempt to identify themselves as having authority to extract the sort of information they were seeking. I don't think that's fair. Are you saying that this is the Sunday Times journalist? I'm not saying this is the Sunday Times journalist. We don't know who the telephone calls were originated by. Not only did the Sunday Times not do these things that we were accused of by Barclays, but we prompted nobody to do so, and we employed nobody to do so. So why do you think it is that the Prime Minister and Barclays Bank think that deception and impersonation was used? I think it's a pity that the Prime Minister and the Sunday Times are now involved in a public slanging match, but I think that's because the Prime Minister has been misled by Barclays Bank into thinking that we did use deception and impersonation. We didn't. We checked out a story. We wanted to make sure it was accurate and we published the story. Tonight, the Sunday Times editor discussed the Barclays allegations with the two journalists who investigated and wrote the story, Barry Penrose and Simon Freeman. They're planning to publish what they call a line-by-line -line refutation of the Barclays statement in next Sunday's paper. The National Union of Journalists has instructed its members at the BBC not to work on next Tuesday's budget programme with David Dimbleby. The majority of journalists involved had voted last night to work as usual. But tonight, a local union official said most would probably obey the instruction. Mr. Dimbleby is in dispute with the NUJ because of his newspaper group in Richmond. The union objects to the company who are printing the papers. The government's ban on unions at the Cheltenham Communications headquarters is to be challenged in the High Court. Nine civil service unions are trying to prove the ban is illegal, and a High Court judge has agreed the case should be heard probably in May. Liverpool's Labour councillors are being urged to accept a compromise in the row over the city's budget. Labour leader Neil Kinnock is against the plans to introduce an illegal budget. Now councillors are being asked to propose a budget within the law that would preserve jobs and services but could mean rate rises of about 60%. A Turkish, immigrant fight, uh, <coughs> excuse me, a Turkish immigrant fighting to stay in Britain is separated from his family tonight. He's in detention, they're still in hiding. Polat Haspodak was caught by police who tricked him into believing an important letter was waiting for him. There's been strong criticism of the way he was caught and a mounting campaign to save his family, who will be deported when they're caught, even though the children are British. Chris Lowe reports. 
Mr. and Mrs. Hasbadak have never denied that they are illegal immigrants and that the deportation order served on them was justified. When we met them last month, they said they'd have happily returned to Turkey if it hadn't been for their children. Eight-year-old Zenep and Fatih, who is six, were born here, have never lived anywhere else and don't want to go. That's why Mr. Hasbadak went into hiding with his family last November and why he remained in hiding until the police finally tracked him down last Tuesday. Their local MP takes up the story. I understand that the police, with the authorization of the government, drew up and delivered a false document and enticed Mr. Hasbadak to go to his former home. And when he went there, they arrested him. It was sleazy, underhand, the kind of thing you'd expect if they were trying to arrest Al Capone instead of a man who loves his wife and children. Mr. Hasbadak has been held in Ashford Remand Centre near Heathrow Airport since last Tuesday, while his wife and children have remained in hiding, deeply upset but fiercely determined to stay in Britain. Supporters of the Hasbadak family have spent months trying to persuade the Home Office to allow them to stay. They argue that the welfare of the children is the paramount issue, but the minister responsible, David Waddington, takes a different view. It would be grossly unfair if we were to say that because a strident campaign had been mounted in one case, uh, the people concerned should be able to escape the consequences of their actions, whereas other people do obey our immigration laws. So will you now be deporting Mr. Hasbadak? Well, that obviously is the consequence of his arrest on a deportation charge. And his wife and children when they're found? Well, they haven't been found yet, but that obviously, uh, we can't deport the children because they are British citizens, as uh, has already been mentioned. But I've no doubt whatsoever that common sense will prevail and father and mother will depart with the children. Greece has recalled her ambassador from Turkey after accusing Turkish warships of firing on one of her own vessels in the Aegean. The Greeks say their destroyer Panther was fired on while she was patrolling inside Greek waters near Samothrake. They say the shots hit the water several hundred metres away. The Greek government has described the incident as a severe provocation by Turkey. And in France tonight, the captains of two Spanish trawlers face heavy fines after they were caught fishing illegally a hundred miles off the Brittany coast. The French Navy machine-gunned the vessels after they'd ignored orders to stop. Nine of the crew were injured as a French boarding party hurled tear gas onto one trawler. The Spanish government has protested and their ambassador has gone to Brest to visit the wounded in hospital. One of the fishermen had to have a leg amputated. Six million civil servants staged a 24-hour strike throughout France in the biggest pay protest since President Mitterrand came to power three years ago. As 15,000 marched to the finance ministry in Paris, air, road and rail communications were disrupted and power cuts hit one in five homes. The strike was called by the communist-led unions after a breakdown in wage negotiations. The government wants to keep wage rises down because of inflation. The Iraqi ambassador in London was summoned to the Foreign Office today to hear an official protest over last week's attack on the bulk carrier Charming. The ship was badly damaged by an Iraqi heat-seeking missile as she headed in convoy towards an Iranian port. Foreign Office Minister Richard Luce told the Commons the government couldn't be expected to take responsibility for British merchant ships in the area since they should all know the risks involved. Dozens of tankers, which once carried oil from the Gulf to the west, are now laid up in Brunei Bay on the North Borneo coast. But it's not the war between Iran and Iraq that's affected them. As Brian Hanrahan reports, it was the oil price rises of the 70s. The tankers started arriving in Brunei Bay in 1976. Now there are nearly 50 of them, casualties of the oil crisis of a decade ago, when oil prices went up and demand for tanker space went down. Least wanted were the super tankers, the newest, largest and most expensive ships afloat. They became, like dinosaurs, victims of their own size and inflexibility. Rather than steam them expensively home, their owners preferred to leave them wherever they were when the work ran out. Saba, which means the land below the wind, offered a Far East anchorage safe from typhoons and with low port fees. There's very little chance that any of these ships will ever work again. What they've been waiting for all these years is not for the price of oil to go down, but for the price of scrap to go up. The onboard watchman is joined each week by engineers who check the ship. But there's nothing they can do about the deck fittings. The high humidity eats at any exposed metal, corroding it beyond use. 
Even idling like this, each ship costs more than a quarter of a million pounds a year to maintain. Most of the money going on sealing the cavernous engine room against the damp. A sudden crisis in which oil had to be stockpiled might bring the empty ship back to life, but realistically, the only time the engines are likely to start again is to move her to the scrapper's yard. Charlton Athletic has been saved. The second division football club was wound up a week ago with debts of more than a million pounds. Today, the High Court accepted a rescue package from a consortium backed by the Sunley Property Group. The manager, Mr. Lenny Lawrence, waited for the news from the High Court along with a group of fans at the supporters club. For him, the supporters and the players, it's been a week of frustration and anxiety. He was waiting for the phone call from the court, which would tell him that the club was back in business and that Charlton Athletic would be playing Grimsby Town on Saturday, instead of a staff of over 40 people being out of work. The news came just before five o'clock. They've agreed it then. We're relieved for everybody, and uh, especially for the supporters. I mean, like they've been hanging on. I mean, we've got a regular band of five, six thousand. I mean, it's been a tragedy for them if it had folded. I think that when you come as close as this to losing the club and therefore losing your job, you come to appreciate what a good life football is and you earn good money and you enjoy what you're doing and it's been very nearly taken away from us all um, and personally it makes me more appreciative of the job I'm doing. By six o'clock the club began to fill up. The players who haven't been paid for two weeks arrived to meet the new consortium of businessmen who've saved Charlton. And for the first time in weeks, the supporters were able to enjoy a drink with the knowledge that the long tradition of football at the Valley was safe once more. Jeff Boycott has been given a one-year contract to play for Yorkshire. The decision was taken by the new county committee meeting for the first time since his supporters won a landslide election victory. The British Medical Association have told boxers in a new report they risk brain damage, eye injuries and death if they keep fighting. The BMA want to ban boxing. Since the war, hundreds of boxers have been killed in the ring, among them Johnny Owen, the British and European bantamweight champion. Gary Lloyd reports. A series of blows to the head cost Welshman Johnny Owen his life. A tragic reminder of the dangers, the BMA report says, that boxers face. One severe punch, it says, is sufficient to cause permanent brain damage. And computer scanning has shown that even young amateur boxers can be affected. Our principal concern is that uh, probably the boxers themselves don't understand uh, the danger which occurs. Uh, secondly, that uh, it is represented that the existing safeguards, such as having a doctor by the ringside uh, and possibly wearing headgear, it's not understood that these are not adequate protection. The BMA's concern is no greater than my own concern with boxing or any other sport. Boxing is a contact sport. It has its dangers. We recognize them. There are other so-called safe sports which are equally dangerous, if not more so. And yet the BMA are doing nothing about that. I feel there is a vendetta against boxing. The BMA report says repair processes of the brain are very limited. Amateurs and professionals are at risk of being left punched out, a permanent sign of boxing's long-term effects. And the main news stories again. The miners' union executives say they'll back any area which decides to strike over pit closures, but there won't be a national ballot. Prescriptions, dental charges and optical treatment are all going up from next month. And the murdered prison official in Northern Ireland hinted in his last message that favours had been shown to senior IRA prisoners. And finally, a young sheep called Snowdrift has set a new record for survival. She's just been discovered by her owner after 45 days buried in the snow near Aberdeen. Today she was sharing a meal with a horse she'd made friends with before the blizzard. She used to eat so much of the horse's food she became very fat and that's why she survived so long. Her owner, Dougal Wiper, had given up looking for her when he saw what he thought was a rabbit in a snowdrift and it turned out to be the sheep's ears sticking out of the hole. She'd lost a third of her weight but now she's fully fit again, and Dougal says she won't be sent to the butchers. The previous record for a sheep surviving in a snowdrift was 33 days. The late news, about quarter to 12 for now. Good night. Hello there. Well, unusually high pressure over Britain at the moment. 
your hot barometer should either be saying very dry or else take me back to the shop. It isn't moving anywhere very fast, but pressure is falling over the Med and over Europe, and that's going to strengthen this northeasterly flow, drag some very cold air down across the southeastern half of Britain over the weekend, and that brings a threat of sleet or snow at times later on Saturday and during Sunday to east and southeast England. For most of us, though, a dry, if slightly colder weekend. Have a look at the satellite picture. There we are. Don't look at the high so much, that big oval of not much cloud, or, or even that ragged sheet of cloud over Britain, which we'll see in a week. But those little dots there over Germany, those are snow showers, and they're coming this way. And then tonight, well, uh, basically a dry night, most, more or less everywhere. Uh, quite a cold night, too, with a touch of frost in many places. Uh, not very cold. Minus one is just 30 degrees Fahrenheit. A little bit of uh, rain or drizzle, light rain over north and west Scotland and a few patches of fog over South Scotland and parts of Northern Ireland too. And then tomorrow, well, basically another dry day. Uh, still one or two of these showers down the east coast, but perhaps a little bit of sleet in places. Still some drizzle in the far northwest. Most of it is dry, a lot of cloud, a little bit of sunshine. Temperatures mild in the west at 46 Fahrenheit, but rather cold, 41 Fahrenheit, 5 centigrade in the east. Light winds everywhere. Good night to you. This Saturday at 9 o'clock, Donna's test approaches in driving ambition. Do you know I'm actually nervous? It's only a test. Well, it's not even that. More an assessment. I mean, you'll just be looking for potential. Those right hand bends. Remember? Uh huh. What's the difference? Well, I took mine on the inside. Took yours on the inside. Why? No traffic coming the other way, was there? Make all your steering decisions in advance. All this last minute steering. Squeaking brakes might make you feel like a pro driver, won't fool a real one. Smoothest is fastest, which is why you took these corners at 60, I took them at 80. Mm -hmm. Wait. You could lose half a stone. But surely I'm not... There's no point stripping the car down to nothing, carrying around seven pounds we don't need. Same goes for you. Pit work, you've got to be just as light on your feet. A tough lesson for the team in driving ambition this Saturday at 9 o'clock. Um... Well, do you think I've got a chance? In five minutes on BBC Two, the 40 Minutes documentary is Demelza's Baby, the story of two women whose very special relationship was put to the test when Demelza became pregnant. Here on BBC One, we come to the ninth episode of Diana. <laughs>